everybody, welcome to another video. I hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. Today I'm gonna to talk a little bit on how to graph logarithmic functions. So before we start, it'll help you so much if you know at least a little bit about how to graph exponential functions and how you know exponential functions and exponent rules especially, all that stuff works. I have a video if you wanna click up here, by the way. But the reason why this helps is because, let's think about it, what do we normally do when we're dealing with logarithms? Well. If we're solving equations or, you know, finding the inverse or, you know, in this case, graphing, we usually take something like this and rewrite it in exponential form, right? These two things are equivalent. We can just rewrite it like this. A couple of reasons why we do this. For one, what if we need to solve for X? This is already solved for X. It makes it pretty simple. Uh, the second reason, and I don't know about y'all, but for me personally, anything with logarithms is just automatically more confusing than anything without logarithms, you know what I mean? So this is just a little kinder on the eyes, a little easier to look at, you know, um, and easier to just deal with in general. So yeah, this is what we normally rewrite it as, and this will look familiar if you know how to graph exponential functions, because we could take something like this and rewrite it in its exponential form, and then that's something we already know how to graph, but there's only one main difference. Let's look, let's rewrite this in exponential form. So two to the y equals x. So I'm gonna draw a little arrow and I'll write two to the y equals x. So this is almost exactly what I graphed in my graphing exponential functions video, except for one difference, and that's that the x and y are flipped. But again, let's think about the relationship between logarithms and exponential functions, and that's that they are inverses of each other. How do we find the inverse of a function? We switch the position of x and y, right? Think about the general form. General form of a law of an exponential function is y equals what? Two to the x, right? This is literally just the x and y flipped, okay? So we know that these two things are inverses of each other. And since these mean the same thing, right? This is just the exponential form and the logarithm form, then these are inverses of each other. So this is really important to make these connections. And the reason why is because just by knowing the inverse, I know a lot of information about this inverse already. I know that the domain is all real numbers. I can plug whatever I want into this, right? So since the domain of this function is all real numbers, we know the range of its inverse is all real numbers, right? So the range of this function is all real numbers. And we didn't have to do any work really other than rewrite it and recognize, oh, okay, this is the inverse. We know its domain. Therefore, we know the range of its inverse. Let's think about what else. We know the range of this. If you remember, it goes from zero, but not including zero, all the way up to infinity. That means that's the domain of this logarithmic function, all right? From zero all the way up to infinity, but not including zero. And this is the main reason why we, we can't plug in zero or any negative number to logarithms. It's not in the domain. The intercepts and asymptotes, a little trickier to think about. It's not as easy as, oh, just flip, you know? But think about it. If I can graph this, which I did in the last video, if I can graph this, I can draw a dotted line, y equals x, and I can do a reflection, right? Uh, these two are symmetrical over that line, y equals x. So that's also pretty cool. What else can we think about a function and its inverse? Let's see, we have the symmetrical, we have the domain and range. Oh yeah, all the points. All the points on the graph of this function, if I just flip those x and y's, there are points on the graph of this function. So let's think about it. When I make a table to graph this, and you can hopefully make the connection between this. I don't know, I think it's pretty cool. Remember when I graphed this, I plugged in for x and I matched it up with y values? Well, think about it. In this case, all of those are flipped. And if you can, you didn't even have to write this. You could erase this, which I will, well, no, I won't, I'll leave it up. But you could have just thought, oh, the x and y is flipped. This is still a one-to-one -one function. I can just plug in for y and get out x values, okay? So what if I just plug in numbers for y and get out x values? So I'm plugging in just from negative two to two. Well, I plug in negative two and I get what? Two to the negative two, which equals one over two squared, which is one fourth. And if you've already graphed this function, this, this looks very familiar. And again, it's gonna be the, the points on this function just flipped, right? This is one half. Then what do I get? I plug in zero for y, I get one for x. Anything to the zero power is one. Plug in one, I get two. Plug in two, I get four. All the x's and y's are flipped because these are inverses of each other. So again, you don't have to make this connection. I'm just pointing out because I personally think it's really helpful and important. Uh, you could have just rewrote it like this and you could have just thought, oh, okay, well I can just plug in for y and get out x values. Because if you start plugging in for x, it gets really confusing. Like what if you plug in, you have to know exactly what to plug in basically. If I plug in something like three, 
two to what power equals three? Well, I don't know. I'd have to use a calculator, and we want to be able to graph these without using a calculator. So this is the best method. I use a combination of, you know, gathering information from its inverse and using that to get information about this function, as well as, you know, making a table and plotting some points. So I can go and graph this and see what it looks like. Let's see. I can go to x equals, I'll start at here, 1, 0, which means what? That's here at x equals 1, y equals 0. That's a what? X-intercept, right? It intersects with the x-axis. So we know we have an x-intercept, and that x-intercept is at what? X equals 1. If you want to write it as a point, I always write it as a point as well. 1, 0, 1, comma, 0. Okay. So let's see what happens. My x is increasing, my y is increasing as well. So I can go up to x equals 2, and I get y equals 1. So I'm here. Then I go up to x equals 4, so 3, 4. And that y equals 2. Okay, so I'm here. So it looks like it's kind of doing something like this. Let's see. This should be up here. Looks like it's kind of doing something like this. All right. So what's it doing down here? Let's think. I'm at x equals 1. Now I'm going to 1 half and then 1 fourth. So I'm getting really small here. At 1 half, I'm at negative 1. Okay. So around here. At 1 fourth, I'm at negative 2. So what do we think this is? Let's see. We're getting closer and closer to that y-axis. And I have a feeling that this is going to be an asymptote. But let's think about this. For the same logic, I mean, can this x ever equal 0? You can't raise 2 to any power and get 0. So since x will never equal 0, and it will never be negative either, right? Then we have an asymptote here. But instead of a horizontal asymptote like we had with the exponential function, we now have a vertical asymptote. So vertical asymptote at what? Vertical asymptote. Sorry, my marker's being weird. At, let's see, x equals 0, right? Vertical asymptote at x equals 0. And again, since it never touches, what, the y-axis, we have no y-intercept, no y-intercept, never touches the y-axis. So this is a, just a general sketch of this function, okay? But what if we, again, let's draw this dotted line at the line y equals x. Dotted line, and if we think back to our exponential function, it's just a reflection, right? Our exponential function, we were here, and then we were at what? Here... It did an exact reflection. We went like this. Right? It reflected, and then here it went down this way. So it is a reflection over the line y equals x. My drawings are not the best, so it's not always the clearest to see. And that's why I wouldn't rely on this. But it's still good to note, you know? If you draw its inverse and it's clearly not a reflection, then you clearly did something wrong. So let's go and get into a few more examples of graphing these log functions. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and graph this logarithmic function. And in general, there are two main strategies that are usually used to graph logarithmic functions. The first one is what I just did, which is converting to exponential form, drawing a table, and then using the information from that table to draw your graph, basically just plotting the points. The second method, the second strategy, is using transformations. Okay, so maybe you've done this with quadratics or exponential functions, but... Basically, I just write out the parent function for this function, which is actually just y equals log base 2 of x. We already have that graph, right? And then I apply whatever transformations I need to apply to graph this function. So which method you use is up to you and the instruction of your teacher, right? Uh, there are pros and cons to both, I think. Um, con converting to exponential and making the table tends to be more precise. You have precise points and you can get a really precise graph. But it can also be more work, you know, just using transformations a lot of times is very fast and quick, but you get more of just a rougher sketch of the graph. So it's up to you and it's up to the instruction of your professor. For the sake of this video, I'm going to do both. And I'm going to start by converting this to exponential form, making a table and graphing using that table. Then I'm going to use what I know about transformations to confirm, to check my answer, basically. So I'll go ahead and write this in exponential form. But before I just go ahead and do this 2 to the y equals x plus 2 thing, what do I need to do? I need to add 1 to both sides, plus 1, plus 1, okay? Now I have y plus 1 equals log base 2 of x plus 2. Now I can do that little trick with my arrows, but I need to have this log by itself. That minus 1 was messing me up. So now I have 2 to the y plus 1 equals x plus 2. So let me go ahead and rewrite that. 
I'll draw an arrow here and rewrite it here. So I have 2 to the y plus 1 equals x plus 2. And remember, when I drew my table, I plugged in for y, and I got x values. So let me go ahead and draw my table, x and y. Remember, I decided that since my, the y was what's in the exponent, it's easier to just plug in for y and find x values, right? So since I'm doing that, it would make a lot of sense to solve for x, basically x by itself, subtract 2 from both sides, right? So if I subtract 2 from both sides, I can get x by itself, and it makes it a little easier on me, you know. I got 2 to the y plus 1 uh, minus 2 equals x. Now I can start plugging stuff in, and these numbers might get a little messy, but... I'm just gonna, I'm gonna trudge through it. Let's see what happens. Okay, I plug in negative two. I get two to the negative two plus one. That's two to the negative one, okay? Two to the negative one, that can be rewritten as one half, but I still have to subtract two. So I get one half minus two. That gives me what? Two can be rewritten as four over two. That gives me negative three over two. Negative three over two. See, I'm getting real precise with this. All right, now I plug in negative 1. Negative 1 plus 1, that's 0. 2 to the 0 is just 1. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. That one was a little easier. Okay, now what if I plug in 0? I get 2 to the 1. That is just 2. Minus 2, that is 0. Not too bad. All right, now if I plug in 1, I get 2 to the 1 plus 1. That is 2 squared. That is 4. Minus 2, that gives me 2. And I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. Feel free to write these down and check, double check my work for me. All right, if I plug in 2, what happens? Let's see. 2 to the 2 plus 1, that's 2 cubed. That's 8, right? 2 cubed is 8. Minus 2, that is 6. So I get 6 here. All right. So let's go ahead and graph all these points. I'll start with 0, 0. And now I got what? 2, 1. So I'm going to here. And then I have 6, 2. Wow, that's way over here. 1, 2, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't even have room for 6, do I? 6, 2, so somewhere like way over here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and graph this. All right, now what else do I have? Negative 1, negative 1, so that's somewhere around here. And then negative 3 halves, negative 2, so that's like right between negative one and negative two and down here all right i see what's happening here so i can draw this line but here's what's cool about knowing a little bit about transformations when you do this is because if i know a little bit about transformations i know exactly what's happening with my asymptote right based on this shift whether it shifts how much it shifts horizontally i know where my new asymptote is Let's see, 2 is being added directly to the x, so that means this is going to shift left 2 units. I'm subtracting 1 out here, so it's actually going to shift left 2 and down 1. So what if I start with this point and I go left 2, down 1, 1, 2, down 1, it becomes that point, right? So I've shifted left 2, down 1. So now my vertical asymptote, instead of being at x equals 0, is now at x equals negative 2. That vertical shift didn't affect my asymptote. I could shift up and down all day. It's the horizontal shift that affects my asymptote, right? So I guess if you didn't know anything about transformations, hopefully you would have noticed that and you wouldn't have drawn your line all the way through. That's the point I'm trying to make is it does help to know about transformations. And that's mostly just to get like the domain and range. Let's see, has my domain changed? My domain has changed now. Instead of from zero to infinity, I'm from negative to 2 to infinity. So maybe I should write out the information for this function. Domain, uh, let's see, negative 2 to infinity. The range is still from negative infinity to positive infinity. That hasn't changed. And now I have my vertical asymptote. That's at x equals negative 2. It was at x equals 0, but we shifted left 2 units. What else? All right, so lastly, I can see that my x-intercept was at x equals 1, and now it has shifted over to x equals 0. So x-intercept is now at x equals 0. x-intercept 
So now at x equals zero, we can clearly see that from the graph and maybe you expected it to be at x equals negative one because of this shift, but this vertical shift down also affects the x-intercept, right? I could pull this, I could just pull this vertically down and change the x-intercept without even shifting it left and right. So this stuff is a little tricky, but I hope this example helped you. I really hope this cleared some stuff up if you were struggling. If there are any questions, please leave them below. And if you want me to touch on this topic again, I would be happy to, but I hope you enjoy it. I hope this helped. Uh, hit like, hit subscribe if you did. Leave questions in the comments. Keep flexing those brain muscles, and I'll see you in the next video.